if a person's following kind of those four pillars, fasting, control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat, they will move the needle and the insulin resistance will be gone, usually in weeks, in months perhaps. Looking for a better sleep? Try Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers and get seven forms of magnesium in each capsule. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to save 10%. Ben, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Hey, Jesse, I'm doing really well. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed your book. This is such an important topic since we are going to be talking about the most common health challenge people are facing worldwide at the moment, which is insulin resistance. So let's start off by talking about why this is such a problem. So people are having elevated insulin, their body's not responding to it very well. What kind of different conditions will this create in the body? Yeah, in fact, you really started off on a strong point just by explaining insulin resistance yourself. You'd mentioned insulin resistance, just so that we all have a, a common understanding of the villain here, is when insulin isn't working quite right and there's too much of it, just like you said. We've gotten to this point because of a variety of factors. There's not one single factor that's brought us here. I will. I like to think of them as being primary causes and secondary causes. In the primary causes, what I consider primary are those that have these are these are stimuli that are altering the body and making the body insulin resistant that have been validated in human studies. And these three primary causes, each independent of the other, so these are independent causes. One is stress, the increase of the stress hormones, uh, cortisol and epinephrine. Those will uh, create insulin resistance in the body. And of course, we have a lot of that nowadays, right? Two, inflammation. That one's a little vague. People like to blame infl inflammation for a lot of things nowadays without it being entirely justified. So that's a bit of a vague one, but nevertheless, if there is inflammation or increased um, immune proteins in the blood, that will promote insulin resistance. And then third, chronically elevated insulin itself will promote insulin resistance in the body. And that's the one that I usually focus on the most, uh, and I certainly do in my book, uh, as you'd know, uh, because that's the one you can change so readily. It's hard to change stress. It's hard to change inflammation. It's very easy to change insulin. And then the secondary cause is uh, refined seed oils. Refined seed oils will accumulate in cells throughout the body, including fat cells, and change the way fat cells grow, making the fat cells more insulin resistant. And then we have the insulin resistance uh, uh, starting and then moving through the body. Well, I definitely want to take some time further in our conversation to talk about what we can do about this and the positive changes we can make with diet and lifestyle. But first, let's dive into why this is an issue. Somebody's facing insulin resistance. Why do they care? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's kind of two parts to your question then. Why is it an issue and then why do they care? Um, it, it is an issue partly from what I just mentioned where we have put ourselves in, in the perfectly wrong environment, this perfect storm where we are underslept, which is increasing our stress um, hormones, and we are eating foods that are increasing our insulin all the time. So that's kind of why we got here. But why someone should care about it is a, a function of the diseases that are derivative from insulin resistance. And these are not um, inconsequential. In fact, pretty much every disease that everyone listening is worried about, it's probably either directly caused by insulin resistance or exacerbated by insulin resistance. And this covers the, the whole gamut of problems, including neurological disorders like migraine disease and Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, um, which is the most common killer, is overwhelmingly very often a result of insulin resistance and affecting the blood vessels. Speaking of blood vessels, erectile dysfunction is a consequence of at least partly of insulin resistance. The most common infertility in women polycystic ovary syndrome is a consequence of insulin resistance as well. And then fatty liver disease and osteoarthritis and more and more and more. So insulin resistance pretty much will make every disorder worse or cause the disorder if it wasn't already there. Okay. So lots of reasons we need to be concerned about this. Like you mentioned early on, this is at the core of a, most of our chronic health issues that we're facing today. So if somebody is listening and they're like, okay, this is something I need to be aware of, something I need to make sure isn't having a degradating effect on my health, how do they begin? How do they know if this is a problem that's, that's impacting them? Yeah, so there are a few key things that the person could pay attention to 
um, to, to give an to get an idea of how insulin resistant they are or where they are on that spectrum of insulin resistant to insulin sensitive. There are uh, uh, the diseases I just mentioned, for example, uh, if a guy has erectile dysfunction or if a gal has PCOS, that's pretty solid evidence that they actually have insulin resistance. Short of those overt diseases, there are some other markers. Some of them are more clinical, like hypertension. If a person has hypertension, that's a very good sign that they have insulin resistance. And then others are a little less clinical and a little more obvious, namely problems on the skin. There are a couple um, very prominent and, and clear um, skin disorders that are related to insulin resistance. And then one of them is this uh, situation of skin tags where a person starts to get these little bumps. And I don't mean like a mole, like a kind of big hill of skin, but rather like a little mushroom, a little stalk of skin, teeny, of course, but jutting up from the skin. And this it happens at skin folds where skin rubs. So it can happen at the armpits. It can happen around the neck if a person is heavy enough to have skin fold around their neck. It can happen around other joints, around the groin, etc. Anywhere skin may rub. If a person has skin tags, and usually the armpits are the most common spot, that's a pretty strong sign that they have insulin resistance. Another one, at those same regions of skin, you can have these dark patches, like a person with a skin fold around their neck. Yeah, they may have some skin tags. They may also have kind of rougher, um, rougher, wrinkled, darker complected skin in that same area. That's a condition called acanthosis nigricans. Of course, it's easier to see that on someone with a fairer complexion. But even in a darker complexion, the skin might not be getting obviously darker, but it's going to feel very different. It's going to be much more kind of cracked and rough. So those are two skin uh, conditions. Again, less clinical, but more obvious than others. And then for somebody who is starting to experience these changes with the skin, is it a sign that they're pretty far into this or do they occur pretty quickly down the continuum? Yeah. Yeah. So I can't speak to the temporal nature of it all, uh, but but you can certainly have skin disorders occurring before in some of the others. Absolutely. So I guess with that in mind, uh, because you can have the skin disorders without these other conditions, I think it's probably safe to say that it's kind of a canary in the coal mine. It's one of the earlier indicators. I'd love for you to talk on the physiology. What kind of changes are happening at a cellular level when the skin does change in that way? Those yeah, couple of yeah. different ways. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so in both instances, it's an, uh, uh, if you will, a hyper excitability where the elevated insulin levels in the blood that occur with hyper uh, with insulin resistance, they are stimulating two different types of cells in the skin. On one hand, they're stimulating keratinocytes, and those are the that stimulation of the keratinocyte growth is what's causing the skin tags, this extension of the skin up. At the same time, insulin is stimulating the production of melanin from melanocytes, which is resulting in that darker pigment around the area. So in both instances, keratinocytes in the case of the skin tags or melanocytes and melanin in the case of acanthosis nigricans, it's a result of insulin basically stimulating some of these skin cells, and there are a lot of other skin cells, stimulating them to do too much. Interesting. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand from reading your book is basically insulin resistance can be looked at on a continuum where oh, yeah. early on, you're not going to really notice any symptoms. Symptoms like we've talked about are going to slowly pick up over time. And then when you're, you've are you been into it, even for years, that's when things like type 2 diabetes can yep. manifest. So yep, I'd love yep. for you to talk on that in, in that continuum. Yeah, yeah, that's part of what's so insidious about insulin resistance is that it can go clinically undetected for so long or it masks itself as other problems and so it doesn't go undiagnosed, it goes misdiagnosed. So in other words, the person has hypertension and infertility and that's what they get diagnosed with. You have hypertension and infertility. And the physician could have diagnosed the person as actually just having insulin resistance and the hypertension and the infertility were simply manifestations of the true problem. Um, but alternatively, the problem is just kind of stewing in the background. Things are getting a little worse, but not to the level of it's on the radar of the clinician. But the, prob uh, the relationship of insulin resistance to type 2 diabetes is one that I'm particularly passionate about highlighting because it's a simple matter of looking at the wrong thing. Over the course of someone's life, 
as they are moving towards type 2 diabetes, we have two relevant variables, insulin and glucose. Over the years of this person progressing towards type 2 diabetes, the insulin has been climbing. This is, this is insulin resistance. Elevated insulin, but normal glucose. The body just needs more insulin in order to keep the glucose in check. So this is why it goes missed, because we look at type 2 diabetes as a glucose problem. And so if the glucose levels are staying normal, well, then there's nothing to detect. However, if we looked at type 2 diabetes as an insulin problem, we would detect that much, much sooner. Because you can have high insulin and normal glucose for years. And then maybe 10 or even 20 years later, now the glucose has started climbing. And again, because we have such a glucose-centric paradigm, that's when we typically detect the problem. The tragedy is even further manifested in the fact that because we look at type 2 diabetes as a glucose disease, we only care about lowering the glucose. So here we are in the state of type 2 diabetes, now elevated insulin and now elevated glucose. And so the average clinical view would say, well, let's just push the glucose down any way we can because it's a glucose disease. Again, that's the wrong view. But in order to do that, the clinician feels justified in doing whatever he or she needs to to push the insulin levels up even higher. So they may put the patient on insulin therapy or drugs that produce more and stimulate the synthesis of more insulin. And now they're becoming even more hyperinsulinemic or elevated insulin. And sure, it might actually lower the glucose levels, but the tragedy, the proof is in the pudding in that by pushing the person's glucose down, by pushing the insulin up even higher, we make them fatter and sicker and we kill them faster. That sounds very controversial. I wouldn't say it if there weren't data to support it. No clinical marker gets better when we aggressively push the insulin up to lower the glucose. Again, nothing gets better. And they are three times more likely to die from heart disease and twice as likely to die from cancer and twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Because these aren't glucose disorders. Type 2 diabetes, like all the others, are insulin disorders. Now, certainly the glucose contributes to insulin. You know, if we're putting too much glucose, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, though. So I'm not trying to say that insulin and glucose aren't related at all. But an insulin resistance, that's elevated insulin and normal glucose. It's when the glucose starts to climb because the body is so resistant to insulin. Now we typically say it's type 2 diabetic. Again, the tragedy is that we're looking at the wrong marker. If we looked at type 2 diabetes and many other disorders as problems of insulin, we would detect them sooner and treat them better. And what I'm hearing you saying is we're not only, you know, not treating the root of the issue, we're making things worse. We're basically right. treating the symptom and things are getting worse in the background. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, Jesse, here's a provocative analogy. Giving a type 2 diabetic insulin is like giving an alcoholic another glass of wine. We're giving them more of the very thing that caused the problem. And in your experience, are you finding clinicians are becoming aware of, of this new paradigm that you're helping bring light to? Is this yeah. changing in a positive direction or are we still kind of at ground zero? Yeah, so it's changing. There's no question it's changing. There's also no question that it's a very, very slow moving ship. Even the American Diabetes Association in 2020 noted or uh, maybe it was just a year before that, noted that low-carb diets have the greatest scientific evidence of all dietary interventions in improving type 2 diabetes. And I just had a conversation on just this very week with a local physician who wanted to pick my brain about these matters because he's starting to see the light, if you will. So there are indeed more and more clinical entities and clinicians themselves who are getting wise to this, this reality of, of, a, of a needed paradigm shift. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, clinicians, myself included, until reading your book, I kind of lump insulin resistance with type 2 diabetes, picturing somebody that's neglected their, their diet and lifestyle for a lot of years, yep. gained a lot of extra weight. Yep. Let's talk about that. If somebody is looking at their body right now and saying, you know, I'm not overweight. This, this podcast isn't yeah. for me. I feel, I feel good. Talk about how common that is to see somebody who's of quote unquote normal weight, but yep. still suffering from this insulin resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, there is a, a metric that has been theorized to be relevant in this, uh, relevant to this conversation and relevant to insulin resistance and, and body fat, something called the personal fat threshold. I, I actually kind of, I like that view. 
the basic view is, um, with some nuance that we maybe can take the time to get into, it's that people have a, a kind of a fat cell threshold. That when the fat there, when that person's fat cells have reached a point, beyond that point, any further fat gain in the body starts to become pathogenic. Now you have to have fat. We need fat. We're built to have fat. Uh, people who have diseases called lipodystrophy, where they can't store fat, have it, it's catastrophic. It, it's it profoundly unhealthy um, for the person. Although they look exquisitely lean, you'd think they're the healthiest, fittest people on the planet, but they're not. So we need to have fat. We just don't want too much of it, as is so often the case with so many things. Too much is too is not good. So in the case of body fat levels. It's, there's a tremendous range of where a person can be healthy with a given amount of body fat. Now, I did my postdoctoral um, fellowship in Singapore, this beautiful country in Southeast Asia on the other side of the world, and I worked with um, Duke Medical School there. Part of the reason Singapore was aggressive at recruiting scientists to study metabolic disorders was partly born from their interest in the ethnic disparities or differences where, where you have different ethnicities that start to suffer the consequences of, of metabolic disorders and fat gain at much different levels than other ethnicities. So, for example, in Singapore, you would have a, a man of Chinese ethnicity and a man of Northern European ethnicity, kind of Jesse, more like me and you, kind of prototypical kind of European Caucasian fellow. And they could both be gaining fat. And the Chinese ethnicity starts to suffer the consequences of that fat gain much, much sooner than the, than the Caucasian guy. The Caucasian guy can get much fatter, and only then is he starting to have the complications, and I would say the insulin resistance, that the Chinese fellow was having much sooner. And, and a lot of it goes right down to the fat cells themselves. When we start gaining fat, we can gain fat through two different processes. On one hand, we can have fat cells growing through size only. And this is where the overwhelming majority of people are. Now, um, some, uh, well, I'll come to the other one in just a sec. So most people will reach a point where they, their fat cell number is set and they don't make any new fat cells as they're gaining weight. They start just growing the fat cells. And when the fat cells are what's called hypertrophied or, or just grown themselves, now the fat cell starts to become insulin resistant. And it starts to become pro-inflammatory, actually. So now it's leaking fats and it's leaking pro-inflammatory proteins. And that starts to contribute to insulin resistance throughout the rest of the body. But it's because, again, the fat cells basically reach their limit. And that's evocative of that personal fat threshold that I just mentioned a moment ago. In contrast, we have some people, and, and this can be reflected across to varying degrees ethnicities, who have a greater potential to, to create new fat cells. So they have the, whatever their number of fat cells are, the fat cells start to grow a little, they start to hypertrophy a little, and then we start to recruit new fat cells into that fat tissue. And so now they can keep growing fatter, 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 and they're never reaching their limit. Or in other words, they're never getting past their threshold of fat storage. Because Oddly enough, if you can always just keep storing fat in your fat cells, the fat cells stay fat and happy and insulin sensitive, and the rest of the body does too. In fact, this phenomenon is so obvious and so effective that we have drugs, an entire class of drugs, that only act by stimulating hypertrophic fat cells to switch into hyperplastic fat cells, more but smaller. And so they're smaller, and so they stay a little healthier, and they always have a little more fat they can store. And the moment they get almost close to a threshold, well, then we just make a new fat cell. So there are some people, a very small group, about 10% of people who are considered obese have this kind of ongoing potential for hyperplasia. And these are the people who can become super massively obese, 500, 600 pounds, Jesse, you and I could never get that fat. We just don't have the body type for it. The overwhelming majority of people listening to this could never get that big. They just aren't built for it. They would have gotten hypert uh, hypertrophic fat cells and stopped gaining fat and then started to become very, very insulin resistant. So ironically, if you can always continue to store fat in your fat cells, you'll basically never become insulin resistant. Fascinating. So knowing what we know about the hyperplasia versus hypertrophy, other than these drugs, is there anything we can do on a practical level to utilize that information? 
Yeah, there is. There are some actionable items. Um, we know that there are certain insults that will promote selectively um, hypertrophy of the fat cells. So it will push the fat cells to grow through hypertrophy. And I'd mentioned earlier that refined seed oils are what I consider to be a secondary cause of insulin resistance. This is where they become relevant in this story, at least. They are relevant in other stories, but in the story of insulin resistance, it's all about the fat cell. When fat cells are accumulating linoleic acid, and that is the primary fat that is in these seed oils, and sometimes people call them vegetable oils, but they're not vegetable. There's nothing vegetable about them. They're refined from seeds like soybeans, corn seeds, um, cotton seed, canola seed, etc. So these linoleic acid will accumulate in the fat cells, and then it will undergo a process called peroxidation. And then once it's uh, gone through that pathway, you end up creating molecules that will promote hypertrophy of the fat cell. Now, insulin can do that as well. Uh, so in addition to scrutinizing seed oils, this is another call to scrutinize insulin spiking foods because high insulin can also promote the accumulation of certain fats within the fat cell that cause the fat cell to grow through hypertrophy. But the, the sum of all of this is that if we're stimulating hypertrophic growth of the fat cell, then we're stimulating the insulin resistance of the fat cell and the pro-inflammatory conditions of the fat cell as well. So those, are, those would be some actionable items, not that we're getting, I don't want to get ahead of myself and talk all about the solutions yet, but those are some right there. Scrutinize seed oils and scrutinize insulin spiking foods. So if I'm understanding this correctly, then with some of these, these bad oils, using them will cause the fat cells to grow in size versus divide the, the hypertrophy versus the yep. hyperplasia. And then eventually you talked about this before where they get to a certain size, they explode and they can cause inflammation in the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, they don't explode, you know, of course. But I, I appreciate, I think, what you're, you're, you're saying here where they basically get to a point of maximum size and to prevent themselves from exploding, if you will, they start to become insulin resistant because insulin would always try to tell the fat cell to grow, 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 grow. This fat cell has reached a point where it tells insulin, I can't grow anymore lest I explode. So I'm going to become resistant to you. And it does. Got it. So the resistance happens, but doesn't it also leak something out of the cell when it gets to a certain size? Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. In fact, it's the two things I just mentioned. So yeah. in order to prevent its further growth, insulin basically, the fat cell can't stop insulin from pushing fat in. So fat keeps coming in. Insulin would normally tell the fat cell to not let any out. That's what's broken. So fat keeps coming in. And, but now the fat cell is saying, you're trying to get me even fatter. I can't do that. So I'm going to start leaking out fats now. You know, and so the fat cells reached a kind of a static point. It got really big and now it's staying there. Insulin keeps pushing fat in, which is what allowed it to grow. And now the fat cells leaking out as much as is coming in. So it's sort of reached an equilibrium. And so it's leaking free fatty acids. At the same time, as all the fat cells are getting hypertrophic, they're actually getting pushed further and further away from capillaries or blood because a cell needs to be within just a couple cells of blood in order to get nutrients and exchange all the metabolites that it needs. As the fat cells are getting bigger and pushing each other further and further from the blood, they become hypoxic or low oxygen. And in order to try to fix that, the fat cells start releasing pro-inflammatory proteins, some of which can start to grow new capillaries. It ends up being a losing battle. But ultimately, the tragedy in this situation is the hypertrophic fat cell is doing everything it can to ensure its own survival. In order to, pre to prevent it from, it from growing too big, it becomes insulin resistant. In order to correct the hypoxia and restore normal blood flow, it becomes pro-inflammatory. Well, it works. It does allow the fat cell to survive, but in the process, it's leaking free fatty acids throughout the rest of the body, leaking now pro-inflammatory cytokines throughout the rest of the body, and those both create a kind of a perfect ingredient list of promoting insulin resistance throughout the body. I hear what you're saying there. Let's stick on this physiology and get a little bit deeper into things here. And by the sounds of it, when somebody starts to develop insulin resistance, it sounds like the fat tissue is the first of the cascade to be impacted. Am I right about that? Yeah, well, it's certainly my view, Jesse. So uh, I am very much an advocate of the fat first paradigm. But, but for full disclosure, there are other 
scientists who believe it's the muscle cell that goes first. Others believe it's the liver cell. My view is it's fat cell first, and then that that impacts those other two. And I have my reasons for it. Okay. Can you explain oh, your for thought sure. process yeah, gladly. on that? Yep, yep. So in both of those instances of liver insulin resistance and muscle insulin resistance, every one of those advocates espouses the idea that they that they become lipid loaded. So all of the paradigm that is based on the liver becoming insulin resistant and the fat cell become uh, the, sorry, the muscle cell becoming insulin resistant is based on the idea that they have too much fat coming to them. And then my response is, well, where did the fat come from? It's coming from the fat cell. And so there's th that that's my response is that that if you just take the muscle cell itself you know what the, I mean, if, to be frank uh, even my view um as much as I am an advocate of the fat first view the reality is likely more nuanced which is to varying degrees depending on the insult they all could be um becoming insulin resistant so for example if someone had an autoimmune disease and they had chronically elevated levels of pro-inflammatory proteins called cytokines, which, which is happening during an autoimmune disease when it's an active phase because sometimes there's kind of a quiescent phase as well. But let's say that person has an aggressive, active autoimmunity. You can take muscle cells and liver cells and fat cells and I think every other cell that I'm aware of. And if you incubate them with these pro-inflammatory proteins, they all become insulin resistant. So in the sense of of inflammation, inflammation can cause insulin resistance at all of them at the same time. There wouldn't be any first. The first thing would have been immune cells are releasing pro-inflammatory proteins. Now, in the case of one tissue starting it, um, whether it was the liver starting in the liver, starting in the muscle, starting in the fat, again, all the advocates of the fat first view or the liver first view start with something like they have lipotoxicity or they've accumulated too much lipid or too much fat. And my, again, response is, well, where did it come from? I don't think you can look at the lipid accumulation in the muscle cells without appreciating where that came from. And in my view, it's coming from the insulin resistant fat cell. Let's go a bit deeper into the fat and talk about the two different kinds of fat, because not all fat is created equal. And you break this down in your book, the brown fat versus the subcutaneous white fat. So let's let's compare and contrast the two and talk about the differences. Yeah. So when people think about fat, they think about white fat. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter the complexion of the person. White fat is white fat. So when you actually, you know, peel back the skin, that's a gruesome way. If you pull out a piece of fat, I'll say it that way. If you do a little fat biopsy like we do in the lab, if you look at the fat from a human and from a rodent, it's it is in fact a, a pretty bright white. And it's white because it's for the same reasons that the fat is white on a big steak. You know, when you kind of look at the steak, it, what it's marbled with, the marbling or the fat is white. Fat is white um, for the most part. Um, so, and that, that, that triglyceride in that animal meat is the same triglyceride that we have in our meat, if you will. And so it, it just is, is a white fat. The whiteness is a reflection, well, literally as the light's reflecting, of the type of fat that's in there. These triglycerides and the nature of the fat cell itself, which is in these fat cells that we call white fat cells or white adipocytes, they are almost 100%, almost, so 98% is, is like if you look at within the body of the cell, almost all of it is one huge bubble of fat, what's called a lipid droplet. Then you have a little bit along the side, you have the mitochondria and the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum and the lysosome, the other little kind of organelles of the cell, the little parts within every cell that help the cell do its job. But it's kind of tucked up against the side. You don't even see them. In contrast, in brown adipocytes or brown fat cells, it looks, in fact, a little brown. Because when you look at the cell now, there are little pockets of fat droplets or lipid droplets, but then there's a lot of mitochondria intermingled with all the lipid droplets. And mitochondria have a reddish brownish color in part because of the iron and the other proteins that are in there. They have a kind of ruddy brownish complexion to them. And that's reflected in the brown adipocytes themselves. Again, because there's little pockets of fat and a lot of mitochondria interspersed within those fat droplets. The difference goes beyond appearance and it goes into the level of function. White adipose tissue is designed to store energy. 
And thus, it's no surprise that it has a very low metabolic rate. It has the lowest metabolic rate of any cell we've ever tested in my lab. Super low metabolic rate. In contrast, brown fat with all their mitochondria have a very high metabolic rate, in fact, comparable to muscle cells. But interestingly, muscle cells have a high metabolic rate because they're active, they're doing work. They're contracting and relaxing and moving the body around. Well, what are fat cells doing? They're just sitting there. Brown fat cells have a high metabolic rate because they're chewing through fats and glucose. They're burning fats and glucose to create heat, which is kind of the ultimate sign of chemical inefficiency. So these are, these are fat cells whose mitochondria don't care to get any work done in the cell, like contracting a muscle and relaxing it. They're just burning energy, burning nutrients to create heat. Now, there's something interesting about this through the lifespan of a human. <clears throat> when babies are born, they're very chubby. They're supposed to be chubby. It's healthy for the baby to be chubby. It's unhealthy if the baby's not chubby. One of the reasons the baby doesn't shiver, and, and they don't, babies don't shiver, um, they may have a little tremor, but they don't shiver when they're cold because they have a lot of brown fat around their whole body. A lot of their fat is brown fat. Their baby, the baby is a little incubator. It's just burning through nutrients in order to create a lot of energy, a lot of heat energy. As we grow older, we have a shift. You know, the baby has maybe kind of a one-to-one, -one, that's not quite, but let's just say a one-to-one -one brown to white. As we start to get older, the amount of brown fat we have starts to drop a lot. The amount of white fat we have starts to increase dramatically. And by the time we're adults, we pretty much just have a little bits of brown fat in this thoracic cavity and around the neck. Why it's there is a matter of speculation. Why not have it on our belly or our butt or our hips or anywhere else? It is a matter of speculation. My speculation is that as we get older, unlike the baby, when we need to get warm, we shiver. Well, we can shiver everywhere except here. There's no muscles up here to shiver. We don't have our muscles in our head start spasming like they do in the rest of our body. And so by having the brown fat around here, it's a very, very good way to heat the blood up as it's going up to the brain if we were cold. And indeed, cold exposure is a wonderful way to activate brown adipose tissue. It's a very well-documented way of activating brown fat. Interestingly, people who have more brown fat, not surprisingly, are more resistant to gaining weight and developing type 2 diabetes. So I think it's a pretty important tool that we can leverage. We could say, how can I stimulate my brown fat? One is cold therapy. Another one is keeping insulin low. We published a paper a few years ago that found that when insulin was elevated, it slowed down the metabolic rate in the brown fat. It basically made brown fat start to behave more like white fat. In contrast, when ketones were elevated, which they can only do when insulin is down, ketones themselves actually help white fat start to behave more like brown fat. So it's pushing them the other way. So as esoteric and irrelevant as this kind of information may seem, it is in fact actionable. We can in fact manipulate our, our fat phenotype, one through cold exposure from time to time, and second, keeping insulin low and ketones up. And Ben, yourself, do you do some kind of cold therapy on a regular basis to stimulate the brown fat? I do. Now, I don't do, I wish I had kind of like a polar dip tub. You say all these kind of sexy tubs these days that are like designed for, uh, there's one that like it gets cold on its own and makes like its own ice. You know, I'm a professor. I can't afford that kind of thing. So I just, what I will do after every workout um, I, I'm lucky to be here on a campus, you know, university has all kinds of resources, including a little sauna right next to the old man's locker room. And so I just go into the sauna for 15 minutes, which I love. And then I will go and take an ice, as cold as that shower can get. I'll stay in that shower for about five minutes. It is not the same as full body immersion. I know that it is not at all, but it's kind of the closest thing I can get to conveniently. Let's stick on the fat topic a bit longer here and talk about the differences between visceral fat, so fat that's in and around the organs, versus the subcutaneous fat. The differences and why, you know, understanding the differences is so important. Yeah, yeah. So the the nature of the cells themselves, um, there's no difference. So a fat cell in the visceral space, like in the abdominal space, like within the abdominal cavity, is is identical in function and form to 
to the fat cells that are, uh, you know, on the outside of the belly, the fat that you can pinch and jiggle. The difference is in, I mean, there's a little slightly difference, a slight difference in enzyme expression. And, and the bigger difference is the other cells that kind of move into the area, if you will. So with regards to enzymes and a little, a little difference in function, despite what I just said, how they're identical in function, they're not quite, but they're very, very close. The similarities are much bigger than the differences. Um, the, the fat cells in the visceral space are much more lipolytic. So at any given moment, they're burning, they're releasing and breaking down fat at a much higher rate than fat cells in the subcutaneous fat tissue. Um, to, so to say that another way, um, the body is always more determined to break down visceral fat than it is subcutaneous fat. Um, uh, part of that might be the simple reality that within that kind of intra-abdominal visceral space, there's a finite amount of space. You know, it is in fact kind of a walled off little pocket of the body. And if we have too much fat there, that fat can physically start to impinge or press, physically compress the intestines and the kidneys and the liver and, and the blood flow to those tissues. And so it's not surprising that those fat cells are almost always determined to break themselves down and stay small. At the same time, the visceral fat occupies an interesting area with regards to, to blood flow where when blood is flowing through the intestines and all the nutrients and things that that blood is absorbing from the gut, it then moves into the visceral fat. So the visceral fat is kind of on the front lines of blood flow from the guts. And it is, and, and what might be coming from the guts may on occasion be kind of dirty or leaky. We might have things in, in that blood flow that we didn't want. And so having the visceral fat be a space that can that has a lot of immune cells in it, makes sense for the sake of immunity and defending the body against unwanted pathogens coming in. But it also creates a potential problem where if we have a lot more visceral fat, that means we have a lot more of these immune cells. And immune cells secrete pro-inflammatory proteins at a very high rate. And so more visceral fat leads to more inflammation. And that's, once again, coming back to promoting insulin resistance and the complications that arise from it. In contrast, subcutaneous fat has relatively very little immune cell population. It's just kind of mostly fat cells. But there's an important nuance here that might be missed. Immune cells are everywhere, like macrophages, the kind of poster child of immune cells. And very important, they, can, they live in every tissue. So macro, there's no like macrophage organ, like there is a muscle organ or a fat organ or a brain organ. Macrophages aren't an organ like all white blood cells. They, this, they, they move into tissues. So you have macrophages in your muscle, you have macrophages in your brain, and you have macrophages in your fat cells. They're supposed to be there. They serve a, an important job in all of these tissues. But in the visceral fat, we have a lot more of them naturally. And if we have more visceral fat, then we have a lot more macrophages, and that starts contributing to a higher inflammation load throughout the body. So knowing what we know about visceral fat and how it can lead to inflammation, do we have any control over minimizing the amount of fat in that area? Or is it more just, you know, I have a weight challenge right now and I need to get my weight down as a whole? Or can we kind of target that area and bring the amount of fat there down? Yeah, yeah. So uh, visceral fat is known to grow with fructose consumption and alcohol consumption, but uh, it's it's not that common that people are really going overboard on alcohol. It is much more common that they're going overboard on fructose. And this uh, is a very, very important point, and it's been very well documented in humans. We know from human studies that if you give one group of people a drink that is const that is made up of fructose, like a fructose water drink. Another group is getting a glucose water drink. These are two carbohydrates that have um, I, they're monosaccharides, the simplest form. Or well, sorry, fructose isn't. Um, no, no, fructose is. Sorry, yeah, fructose. Both monosaccharides, and they're isocaloric. So there's no difference in their calorie consumption. They're drinking the exact same amount of calories, and the group that's drinking the fructose solutions are gaining more fat selectively in their visceral fat and relatively less in their subcutaneous fat. That is the exact opposite compared with the glucose drinking group, who is growing more subcutaneous fat and relatively less visceral. So we can absolutely contribute and or reduce 
the visceral fat that we have by changing our diet. And the low-hanging fruit is just eat less fructose, or I should say drink less fructose. When we're drinking sugary um, sodas or we're drinking fruit juice that is pure fructose and water, don't, don't do it. Uh, so control the fructose. And that's not the same as eating fruit. You'd have to eat a hell of a lot of fruit to get enough fructose to start changing visceral fat accumulation. So, you know, that's not the concern. I'm not declaring war on fruit, but I am declaring war on fruit juice and other forms of, you know, highly, highly accessible and highly consumable fructose, like, like sugary sodas and, and fruit juice. And if somebody's concerned that they might have too much visceral fat, well, for one, is there a healthy amount? And two, is there a way to go about assessing how much of that fat you have in that area yeah. to get a baseline and then maybe work on it and retest down the line? Yeah. So there is a, so it is healthy. Um, we, we need to have it uh, because it plays an important role in our immune function, like, you know, kind of scavenging any pathogens from the blood um, right as it's coming from the guts. So it's very, I think it serves a very purpose. I think, you know, it's designed to be there and, and I don't think we'd ever want to try to get rid of it. Um, but, but there are a, a way to kind of get an idea of whether a person has too much. There's not a perfect way to do it at home. Um, there are ways to do it, of course, through MRIs and DEXA scans um, in a clinical situation. But the, the closest someone could come would be probably the waist to hip ratio. And, and that is as simple as it sounds, where you measure the biggest part of the belly around the belly button, and then you measure the biggest part of the butt and hips. And if that ratio, I don't remember the exact cutoffs, but in a guy, it should be, you know, around one, you know, maybe around 0.9. Um, so, and then in a woman, it should be closer to around 0.7 or so. So a woman should be bigger around her hips and butt than she is, than she is around her belly, by you know a pretty decent margin, and a guy um, where we store our fat a little differently naturally, we should be closer to around 0.9, so a little closer to to even. As that ratio is getting higher, so if it's above 0.7 in a woman and above 0.9 in a man, that starts to reflect an imbalance that the person is probably storing more fat in the visceral space and less fat in the subcutaneous space because fat around the button hips is 100% subcutaneous, fat around the belly can be a mix of visceral and subcutaneous. But again, if that ratio is getting higher, the waist to hip, if that ratio is getting bigger, 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 that's a sign that there is more uh, more adipose within the visceral space. If somebody's listening to this and they want to start to, you know, take control of their insulin and make sure they're not insulin resistant, we talked about different symptoms somebody could experience, you know, if they're on that continuum heading towards type two diabetes and they're experiencing, you know, insulin resistance on, on, on the spectrum there. But how, how important would you say it would be for somebody who's starting out on this journey and, and maybe has some of those symptoms to go to the doctor and get the blood work done and actually get their insulin level tested? Oh yeah. 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 I think it's massive. Um, uh, yeah, so so earlier, a lot of what we've been talking about has just been kind of flirting with uh, some idea, you know, some kind of kind of the vague uh, conclusions that you can get from your own by you know looking at your skin tags or looking at your waist to hip ratio. But to really get a definitive sign, you want to get your insulin measured. So if someone is able to convince their clinician to measure their insulin levels in a fasted state, if a person has insulin levels around ten microunits per mil or less. Now, Jesse, do you have some audience in Canada too? I'm from Canada. So yeah, I can tell. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, a little heavier than, than some other shows. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in, in, the, in Canada, it won't be the US um, cyst, uh, metric. Uh, it'll be milli, a molar metric. And I think that's around 30, 35 uh, picomoles per mil. Um, in, in kind of in the Canadian and kind of the UK system, metric system. And I'm from Alberta, so I, I'm fluent in metric system. Um, but uh, so, so nevertheless, if someone can get their fasting um, insulin levels measured, and in the US, it's, you know, around 10 microunits per mil or in Canada, in the rest of the world, it's around 35 or so picomoles per liter. That, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. If it's that around that range or lower, that's a good sign that you're insulin sensitive. If it's higher, that's a warning sign that there's a problem. And if it is, if it's kind of a uh, 50% higher than that, um, that's that's a kind of um, orange flag. Hey, there's something probably wrong. If it's around double that range, you know, so around 20 
um, microunits per mil in, in U.S., around 60 picomoles in, in Canada. That's a, a huge, huge red flag. You're, you're definitely insulin resistant. Something's wrong. You got to correct the course. Now, again, remember, everybody, someone could have those insulin levels and still um, and not have skin tags and not have type 2 diabetes, but they may start to have these other complications. Their blood pressure might be going up. Their infertility might be going up. And so it, it's worthwhile knowing that. If for no other reason, then you can correct the course so much sooner. The sooner you know, the easier and faster it is to turn things around. If you don't know that there's a problem until you're so insulin resistant that your glucose levels have started to spike, or in other words, type 2 diabetes, it's just going to take that much longer to turn things around. Okay. So say somebody realizes they have a problem, either it's definitive, they've gone and gotten their, their insulin tested in a lab, or you know they're just judging by some of the other symptoms, the skin tags, the blood pressure, stuff like that. And they decide, you know, it's time to take control of this and, and I want to do something about it. What are the biggest needle movers? Where do they start? Yeah, yeah. The biggest move is controlling carbohydrates in the diet. 100% absolute definitive. Now, actually, let me also add, a person could just start fasting, but I kind of put that into uh, controlling carbohydrates. In fact, minute for minute, moving the needle the most, fasting is going to move the needle the most, no question. The only problem in my mind with fasting is that too often people will just shrug their shoulders and go on a fast, not without a plan. And in my view, how you end the fast is more important than how long you fast. And that's what I mean by having a plan. A person needs to know, how am I going to end my fast? Because unfortunately, sometimes people just turn it into some kind of glorious binge purge cycle or a glamorous version of it where they fast for 24 hours, get to a super point of hunger, and then just binge on a bunch of junk food. Well, that's not the way to do it, of course. And the net effect of that is not going to be a gain. So if someone can engage in intermittent fasting and couple that with a low carbohydrate diet, then you are... You, that is a one-two punch. You are doing everything. You're cooking with gas. You're doing everything you can in order to, to lower insulin and improve insulin sensitivity. And the results are fantastically fast. Uh, Jesse, it's appropriate for me and you, two Canucks, to mention another Canuck. I'm a good friends with a guy named Jason Fung, who um, is a clinician in Ontario. And he's kind of the godfather of the modern-day fasting interest, the modern-day fasting movement. And he can get type 2 diabetics off of all of their medications in just weeks by engaging in well-structured fasting, including low-carb diet, mind you. So it's, this is something that can, be, that can move the needle. Speaking of moving, moving the needle, man, this is uh, moving the needle. So fasting and controlling carbohydrates. Um, and, and this doesn't need to happen with calorie counting. That's part of the beauty of it. This is not a strategy that is based on low calorie. No, far from it. When it's time to eat, eat until you're full. When you're not hungry, don't eat. And then sometimes you'll push through a little bit of hunger to engage in, in a fast again from time to time. But if a person is fasting and they're following three rules based on the three macronutrients of the diet, they're going to do it. Control carbohydrates, so focus on fruits and vegetables. Don't get your carbohydrates from um, bags and boxes with barcodes. Prioritize protein. Make sure you're getting enough high-quality protein. That By high quality, I mean from, from animal sources. And three, don't be afraid of fat. Fat is a natural food. We need it. There are literally fats that are essential to the human diet. Fats and proteins always come together in nature. That's how we should eat them. So don't be afraid of the fat. Let that fat come liberally with the protein that you're trying to prioritize. And if, that's, if a person's following kind of those four pillars, fasting, control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat, they will move the needle and the insulin resistance will be gone, usually in weeks, in months, perhaps. Let's get into some of the details on what you just broke down there. You mentioned not having protein isolated. Yeah. Is that more of like when somebody takes, you know, a couple of big scoops of protein powder and puts it in a, a fruit smoothie or how, how do they go about making sure that that ratio with fat is, is good? Yeah, yeah. So the ratio is managed by just eating real protein um, or, or something that's, that's you know, mimicking the protein. So the problem with protein shakes is that it's pure protein. And we don't, uh, interestingly, it's almost like the body knows what it's doing or in nature knows what it's doing because in nature, protein never comes alone. 
Never. There's zero instance of pure protein. It, 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 it's impossible. It doesn't exist in nature. Protein always comes with fat. Now, in nature, all protein is animal protein. You don't get plant protein in nature. Um, it doesn't like peas are so deficient in protein that we have to take a thousand peas to get an amino acid load that's comparable to, you know, like a modest amount of hamburger, for example. And I don't mean to poo-poo plant proteins too much, but it's not natural to try to get proteins from plants. Nevertheless, in nature, all proteins would come with fat. That's how we should eat them. Um, when we don't eat it that way, when we're only eating protein alone, we don't digest it very well. It's a little known fact that bile acids that are released when we eat fat actually accelerate the activity of the proteolytic enzymes in the, in the intestines. So we normally have these enzymes that are going to break apart the protein to help us digest and absorb it. But when we do, when we do it without bile acids being released from fat um, consumption, then we don't digest it very well. So we don't digest all the protein that can upset a stomach and make this person feel a little nauseous. Second, we have human evidence that has confirmed this. When you have someone work out, they get a certain amount of muscle growth just from the workout itself. Modest and microscopic. In fact, this is another work from a guy in Canada at McMaster in Ontario. Man, Jesse, this is kind of a Canadian all-star um, moment here. So Jason Fung, and now we're talking about um, Stu Phillips. So he has evidence finding that when you work out, you get a microscopic amount of muscle growth. When you work out and eat protein, you get a microscopic additional amount of muscle growth. Now, when you work out and you eat protein with fat, you get another bump in muscle growth. So protein and fat together elicits a greater anabolic effect at the muscle than the protein alone. Now, if you do a study and you swap out the fat with pure carbohydrate, you have the muscle growth from the exercise, you have the muscle growth from the exercise combined with protein, and now when you add carbohydrate to it, nothing. You've not gone beyond the protein alone. There's no further growth. Again, that is not the same as what happens when you couple fat and protein. Fat and protein does, in fact, go beyond. It is more anabolic than protein alone. That's how we should eat it. And what are your thoughts on doing a workout, whether it be aerobic or resistance training, and then continuing a fast for a period of time after that? Yeah, that's no problem. Once again, Stu Phillips has found that it's most important you eat protein, and I would just add eat protein and fat. And it's kind of like a 24-hour period um, before or after the workout. There's a pretty big range of when the optimal time is to try to get some protein after or, you know, or before. I would never say before. Um, but, but even then, if you ate a lot of protein 12 hours before your workout, well, then you're within the window. So I've heard him say that there's not a protein window. It's more like a protein barn door. I'd love for you to talk more about the animal versus plant protein. You mentioned the fact that, you know, to get, say, a pea protein, you'd need however many peas yeah. and to isolate that down into a concentrate. Yep. I can tell just by the way you're explaining that you're pretty passionate about the importance of getting animal protein in the diet. Talk more about why that is. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of... Uh... A lot of thoughts that go through my mind um, when I and, and that play into my being such an advocate of animal protein. I think plants are a wonderful part of the human diet. I think it can be very much a part of a, of a perfect human diet. So I don't want anyone to misinterpret what I'm saying. But there's just no way around the fact that getting protein from plants is a very um, resource heavy process. It's an inconvenient truth, but it's a real one. A lot of the reason some people will go uh, to plant protein is that they'll think it's maybe better for the planet. But when they appreciate the fact that those soybeans and those peas are grown in one part of the world, now they are literally shipped to an entirely different country, often from the U.S. to China, and then processed in factories and then shipped back to the U.S. or Canada um, in the final product, in the final form of this refined protein. That's a pretty resource-intensive process. So I'm not convinced it's better for the planet, first of all, which may be one of the reasons people are avoiding animal products. But second, there's no question it's inferior in humans. There are ample studies that have quantified the degree of protein, of amino acid bioavailability and absorption. Um, and by every metric, every single animal protein is superior to every single plant protein. So just for the sake of human physiology and human health, my view is, not to mention perhaps planetary health, but that's not my area of expertise, so I won't speak to it. 
just strictly speaking for the body, a person can eat a modest amount of animal protein and know that they are literally getting every single amino acid they could possibly need in a, in a good ratio. If it's plant protein, well, then you kind of have to guess and you hope you're getting it all. Now, an additional factor on the plant protein side is these plant proteins are enriched with things called anti-nutrients. This sounds kind of provocative, but they, it, they, are, they are honest to goodness molecules that will inhibit the intestine's ability to digest the protein. These are things like tannins or trypsin inhibitors or phytates or oxalates that will inhibit these enzymes from breaking down the proteins. So that's kind of adding insult to injury because when someone's trying to get all their protein from plant proteins, not only are they not getting, uh, not only are they getting an inferior source of amino acids and, and, and an inferior profile of amino acids, but they're not even digesting the amino acids and the proteins they think they're getting because of these molecules that are inhibiting the digestion. And then lastly, the kind of nail in the coffin, appropriate me invoking nail, it's, it's this problem with minerals and, and metals, actually, where when you uh, – all plants enrich minerals and metals from the earth. by That's just part of the plant pulling up nutrients, and it needs these metals for their normal function. But it's normally at such a modest amount that it would never really hurt us. Uh, you think about a pea. A pea will have a microscopic amount of lead and maybe arsenic and other thing, other other metals. But when you have concentrated, say, a thousand peas or a thousand soybeans, in the pro for the hope of concentrating the proteins, you have in fact inadvertently concentrated the metals. And there was a a, a, a third party group called the Clean Label Project that quantified the amount of metals in various protein supplements. And not surprisingly, the plant proteins were the biggest offenders. And in their conclusion, some of these plant proteins had potentially toxic levels of metals in them. That's kind of an inconvenient truth, of course, but it is the reality, I think, of the fact that humans are not meant to get protein from plants. That is an unnatural process um, and an unnatural um, – pushing an unnatural physiology. Again, I realize that this is a, a sensitive topic. I truly do, and I realize that people will have myriad reasons for wanting to avoid animal um, pro animal products, animal foods uh, in their food, uh, in their diet. I get it. I understand it, but it doesn't change the reality of the human body. Yeah, no, that's, that's really important. And Ben, you've talked about for somebody who is, you know, dealing with insulin resistance, trying to crack that problem. When it comes to diet, you mentioned fasting and lowering the carbs. I'm curious, can you take us through what a day in your life looks like? Like, when do you break your fast in the morning or in the afternoon? Sure. And what do your meals look like? Yeah, yeah. So if someone wanted to pattern their life after a kind of wrinkled, bald, freckled dude, um, you know, then this would be how to do it. You know, I, I happen to have a pretty decent six pack for a middle aged guy, so maybe there's something to it. Um, my wife's not complaining. I'll say that, Jesse. Um, so <laughs> we just got way too casual. Anyway, maybe you edit that out. Anyway, like so. It. So if someone wanted to, um, yeah, so a little day in the life of Ben Bickman. Um, uh, so I, I usually will fast through breakfast. Um, I find that to be the easiest time to fast. Um, the fact is it's actually healthier to fast through dinner. Um, there's been a study looking at time-restricted eating and moving the window. It is, in fact, a little better to fast in the later part of the day than it is the first part of the day. But it's just not practical for me. I'm a married guy with kids, and I'm going to have dinner with my family. You know, th that's the most social meal um, for, for the family, every family. And that's just not something I, I refuse to fast through dinner. It's just too weird um, for the social dynamic. So I typically fast through breakfast. It's easy to fast through breakfast because my kids are eating breakfast. And the fact that I'm not fasting, um, that I'm fasting, and I may be sipping a cup of tea or something, you know, it's not, no one even cares. No one notices. It doesn't change the dynamic much. At lunch, I will I will sometimes fast through lunch, and I will basically just build up all of my hunger till dinner. I um, mean, I'll come I'll come to that in just a moment. But sometimes I will eat lunch, and when I do eat lunch, I typically will have a big lunch. I'll make sure that my lunch is big and very filling, because that helps me have a more modest dinner. And in fact, I'll I'll tell you that's probably when I'm at my best. It's when I eat a big lunch. I'm really full 
for hours and I go home and it's dinner time and I eat, I, it's so much easier to eat a modest dinner and not overdo it. And to go further, it's so much easier to not snack in the evening. And that to me is the witching hour. If someone can get through the evening, then they've done it because that is when we are at our weakest. That is when the temptations are their greatest and we're kind of prowling around the house trying to find whatever kind of salty, crunchy carbohydrate snack we can find or sweet and gooey carbohydrate snack we can find or sweet and crunchy in the case of cereal, which is my absolute kryptonite. We don't keep cereal in the house, Jesse, because daddy can't handle it. You know, we don't. So we just don't have cereal for breakfast. We, you know, we have homemade breakfast and I make them every morning um, for the kids. But if we have cereal in the house, I, all because of my college days. So any college aged students listening to this, get out of the habit now. You know what is you know what it's like. Cereal is like a college staple for for boys. I would eat so much cereal, and that, I think kind of for lack of a better word, it created an addiction. And in the evenings for me, I am addicted to cereal. Nevertheless, um, if if I eat a big lunch, it really helps me control my appetite for the rest of the day. Sometimes, if I've had my hunger really mounting throughout the day. Um, I won't do it very well and I will overeat at dinner and I will snack through the evening. And so I, I find that if I'm, if I kind of do one meal a day, I have to be incredibly disciplined to make sure that I don't overdo it at dinner, that I eat until I'm full and then I stop. And then I just do everything I can to get through the evening. And some of the ways that I get through the evening without getting too snacky, I will get a big glass of ice and I'll pour in club soda and I'll put in a tablespoon or two of raw apple cider vinegar. And that little bit of tartness just, or this sounds crazy, I will drink pickle juice. It sounds bizarre, but I swear by it. That just takes the edge off my cravings. Just that kind of bitter sour of the vinegar or the, or the pickle juice just does it for me. And my cravings are, are just, they're just put to bed right there. And when you do eat your meals, the, you talked about the bigger lunch and, and dinner, what are some of the foods that you'd include? So um, lunch for me is a mix of almost totally protein and fat, um, very, very little carb or even sometimes no carb whatsoever. Um, like, for example, today I have a, I have a lunch meeting in, in a, actually a couple hours, a late lunch meeting for me, but it's, uh, I go down to this little hot dog joint and I will get like two or three big hot dogs on a plate with sauerkraut and mustard and pickle. And what's interesting about those two foods, those those um, carbohydrates, the sauerkraut and the pickle, is that they've both been fermented. And I'm a huge advocate of fermented foods. The magic of fermentation is that the bacteria take the glucose and they eat the glucose. So by the time we're putting it in our mouth, there's much less glucose than there would have been before. For example, the difference between um, a cucumber and a pickle is that the, the pickle has essentially no more digestible carbohydrate. At that point, it's just pure fiber because the, the bacteria have eaten all of the digestible starches already. And so the glucose load coming in is much less what's going into our bodies. And what the bacteria leave are these short chain fatty acids, these kind of magical little fats that really stimulate metabolic rate and help the body be more insulin sensitive. So that might be a lunch for me, kind of a, a meat and some a little bit of vegetables maybe, or I will, and I don't mean for this to sound like I'm I'm a shill here, but I have a meal replacement that I actually created with a couple of my brothers. I'll just say this, anyone who wants to learn more, go to the website, get health and health is spelled H-L-T-H. So G-E-T-H-L-T-H dot com. And you can learn more about it there. But this is basically, sometimes I'll take a meal replacement shake and I'll put in an extra scoop or so, um, where it's basically a, a, a balance of one-to-one -one protein to fat with some fiber as the carbohydrate source. So that's just some, sometimes if I, if I didn't, if I don't have time to go out to lunch or I don't have a lunch meeting planned and I didn't bring lunch with me, then I just quickly toss together a meal replacement shake. Um, it's really just a matter of convenience in that case. And Ben, earlier we briefly touched on exercise and exercising during a fast, but other than the, the low carbohydrate diet, the fasting, what are some of the other tools for people we're trying to get their ins insulin under control. Yeah, well, it's very appropriate that you mention exercise. There's no question exercise can help. Um, part of the magic of exercise is that when a muscle is contracting, it doesn't need insulin to pull in glucose anymore. Normally it does. 
Normally, the muscle needs insulin in order to kind of open the glucose doors and allow the glucose to come from the blood, lowering blood glucose, and into the muscle to be burned for energy. When a muscle is exercising, it's so hungry that it doesn't have to wait for insulin to tell it what to do. It just starts pulling in the glucose, which allows the insulin to come down during exercise, which it does. And whenever insulin is low, the body's becoming more insulin sensitive. Uh, so exercise is a huge thing. And also, if a person can increase their muscle mass, then that just makes the body more insulin sensitive. My views on exercise are simple, um, but then I can add a layer of complexity to it briefly. And the best exercise to do is the one you will do. So it doesn't matter. Whatever a person can do to just be physically active, do it. In my case, I have, you know, I get to, I'm here on campus and I can kind of sneak down to the gym from time to time when I have time. <clears throat> I do a mix personally of what I call dynamic and static days. And my dynamic days are days when I'm going through typical, um, act, oh, I, I don't lift weights personally. Um, I just do body weight based exercises or calisthenics. Um, I will do on my dynamic days, a bunch of different types of squats, different types of pull-ups, different types of push-ups, different types of handstands, that kind of thing. But I'm actually moving through the motion. It's a dynamic motion. On my static days, I will get to a point of maximal tension and then hold it for about a minute. And so that might be that I'm holding a deep squat with a weight and I'm just squatting right above my ankles, you know, and then holding it, holding it, holding it because it's the point of maximal stretch of the muscle. Or if I'm doing a pull-up, I will pull myself up and try to keep my chest to the bar for as long as I can. And when I can't, then I'll go down 90 degrees and keep it there as long as I can and then go down. So I'll have these anyway, I just mix it up, but I'm a huge advocate more and more of the, of the static days. I started incorporating static days into my workouts about four years ago when I, when I turned 40. That's when I decided to not lift weights anymore. I wanted to do something different. And uh, much to my amazement, um, I, 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 I have roughly the same kind of muscle dimensions as I always have, but I'm much more veiny now. Now, I don't mean vein like I have a big head, although maybe I do, but you know, where I, I the, holding those the, the point of maximal tension and restricting the blood flow that happens from keeping the muscle contracted rather than allowing it to relax for a moment, it has really developed vein growth across my chest and my arms in a way that I've never had. Even at my biggest during my college days where I was about 10 pounds, 15 pounds more muscle than I am now, I wasn't as I didn't have as much vein um, appearance across my muscles. That's just kind of an ego boost. And when you're a middle-aged bald guy, you need all the boost you can get. Um, but but it's it's interesting that that's kind of when it started. It was these when I started incorporating static workouts. That's interesting. And Ben, before we part ways, is there any other hacks or tools that you can give the listeners, things that we can use, maybe even a supplement or or something else that we haven't covered to help keep that insulin at bay? Yeah, so there are some supplements that have that are known to help. If someone isn't already, I would say get a little bit of apple cider vinegar every day, and especially drink it when you have your starchiest, most carbohydrate-heavy meal. Also, with that starch-heavy meal, whatever the heaviest carb meal is, go on a little walk afterwards. Even if it's 10 or 15 minutes, it will bring your glucose levels down so much faster than otherwise. Also, some uh, use of uh, the, the use of cinnamon has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity, and berberine has been shown to also have some of those same effects. And then maybe my one last piece of advice: it's change breakfast and change it tomorrow. When we wake up in the morning, insulin has finally come down over the night. And the last thing I think we want to do is spike our insulin up because if we spike our insulin up a lot for breakfast, we'll get hungrier sooner in the day. And then that basically sets us up on a roller coaster of spiking our insulin all day and because we, we spike it for breakfast and we get hungry two hours later. So we do it again. Then we're hungry at lunch and then an afternoon snack, dinner and an evening snack. And we're spending every waking moment in a state of elevated insulin. So if you're not going to fast through breakfast, at least follow those macronutrient rules that I mentioned. Control your carbs, eat little to no carbs for breakfast and focus more on protein and fat. And that can just help the insulin stay longer uh, lower a little longer into the day. And Ben, I know you got to go, but as you get into the specifics there of breakfast, I just have one question, something you brought up earlier and I didn't get around to, and that's breaking the fast. So are there, you mentioned how important that is when we go back to food to do it a specific way. So A, how long of a fast are we talking when we need to consider this? 
And then B, quickly, what is it we need to consider when we start eating? So in fact, I would say a fast of any length whatsoever, including overnight, like that 12-hour fast, hopefully at least overnight, even that's breaking the fast. And it's just the same, not to sound boring, it's those same ideas. Insulin has been working hard to come down. Don't just go and spike it now. Let it stay a little longer at at a lower level. And so focus on protein and fat. Perfect. All right, Ben, the book is Why We Get Sick. Uh, we're going to link that up in the show notes. You mentioned the product you created with your brothers. So that's going to be linked up as well. Anything else that you want to share or anything else we want to put in the show notes? No, this was great, Jesse. Thanks so much for reaching out. Um, anyone who wants to connect with me on social media, I try to put a little video or two out each week about um, metabolic function. And people can find me mostly on Instagram. I, I have kind of retreated from Twitter. It's a bit too hostile of an environment for me, too political nowadays. Uh, so find me on Instagram, Ben Bickman, B-I-K-M-A-N, Ben Bickman, PhD. Perfect. Ben, I really enjoyed this. Thank you for being so comprehensive and, uh, thank you for your time. Oh, my, my pleasure. This was wonderful. Jesse, thanks so much. This was great. Thanks again.